Um, many of you know Kent worked on this issue for us, for the Commission for the Industry years ago, uh, developed monitoring and, and control practices, best practices. Um, he has uh, started some more work this season, last season, um, and we'll continue that until we get this result. Um, this obviously will be an update on that work. Uh, so, Kim, thank you. Thanks, Ross. So, uh, social media has been used for evil sometimes. I think that's exactly what we're seeing with Black Book Spiders. What I'm going to do today is really focus on how we can kill it um, and try to figure out how best to sample it and what we might be doing in the future. I'm going to describe a little bit why we think there might be an increase in black widow spider fines. And hopefully what I'll do is to give you some information on lowering populations best in your vineyard and show you that I think we've got some real potential in the future with some new ways to control it, um, albeit probably more costly. Um, so today we're going to cover spider identification. One of the issues for any export market is that we used to want spiders in the vineyard to control leaf hoppers, and one of the most common ones is this little theridium. It's the uh, exact same family as the black widow spider belongs to, and its adult is almost unrecognizably similar to the black widow spiderling. We're going to look at the current and past insecticide treatments uh, through some of the trials we did. We did some more this year, and I think that the uh, delayed dormant lower span followed by a pyrethroid in season is probably still our best choice. We've lost lanate, as far as I know now, for an in season. Uh, and what I'm going to do is to uh, describe why insecticides that kill the black widow don't work in the field. That's the most important take home message for today. What we can possibly do to improve our timing and uh, maybe uh, changing cultural practices is always a difficult thing for an entomologist to to discuss because it comes at a, a major cost. And so uh, I will show you some of the things you can do when you put in a new vineyard. Certainly no one's going to change a, a, a vineyard right now which is established for black widows. Um, brief discussion of how to sample for what we did in the laboratory that I know some PCAs have used this program. I think it does work. And I'm very excited about possible future solutions. So. We'll show some videos. The videos will be kind of fun. Andy created them. He actually put music to the last one, which, I mean, when you're going to kill a black widow, that's nice to have music to it as well. So, every time you see one of these social media presentations of black widow, they're always showing the adult female. Um, and they always find some way to turn it upside down through a glass or something like that so you can see the red hourglass underneath. Just the name of it is part of the problem we've got with black widow spider. They don't always kill their mate. It's just got that nasty name. It's got all kinds of things in media. Halloween, kids are dressed up as it. They're very territorial. They'll kill anything that gets close to the web. And so if a male is in their web for too long, it will kill the black widow male. They kill the spiderlings. And in fact, one of the best reductions of the spiderlings which we see here are other spiderlings. They come out, there's nothing to eat, so they start killing each other. So in that oval, that um, white oval, we see two egg sacs there. There's about 260 spiderlings per egg sac. Um, they'll produce about six egg sacs per season, uh, the female will. So there can be this massive explosion we don't see that explosion in the vineyard because of the cannibalism and because it's just hard for them to establish and find food. So they start off as this mass and then they balloon away from that mass or they move away to avoid being eaten by their mom or by someone else, something else. Um, here's a spiderling which has now moved off. It, it, you can see the small silken web coming out of it. Uh, they balloon, they land, they start to try to find food. Uh, and if they don't find food within a while, they, they can go for seven, ten days without eating, without any problem. The adult female can go for three, four months without eating. So, hard to start them out. As they mature, they don't look anything like a black widow. I'm sure we're finding these in table grapes. This is a very beautiful spider coloration on the back. That is a immature black widow female. 
Um, that's not reported in the media because it doesn't look like that Halloween Black Widow spider. So this one, the homeowner gets the table grapes. They just killed us. They don't think twice about it. And all those fines we're getting in Minnesota, Michigan, the East Coast, that's the territory of the brown recluse. Brown recluses in all their garages, much more harmful than black widow spider, much more damaging to humans. Uh, close to an adult female right now, we've got the color pattern. This is from the top. That will become all black, but it has a, a really beautiful kind of orange, yellow, whitish color pattern on top. To the right, we see a male from the top and bottom. Uh, males are probably found uh, just as commonly, but it doesn't look like a black widow. It doesn't have the toxin. Um, most of the time, these smaller stages cannot even hurt you because their mouth parts are so weak. The spiderlings can't pierce your skin and bite you. It has to be a stage about this size of an adult female to actually pierce the skin. Uh, here we've got a, a shot from Pedro. We can see the male on the right, the female on the left. Uh, male was mating with the female and was just going to hang out there for a while. And after mating, the, the female will kind of give it some signal like, get the heck out of here. Uh, and it will, typically. And so. It, that name itself is just a misnomer, but it's the same name for this whole group of Lactrodectus species. There's about 12 of them. They're found throughout the world, including Australia, just a different species there. And for Australia to worry about things like this, everything in Australia is poisonous as far as I know. So. <laughs> Here's work from, from page one or lab from 2003. This is what becomes important. Kathleen really hit on this. When are we finding black widows? We can see a population for over two years from August, increases into September, the population goes down. We see egg sacs, immature adults, and adults. When are the adults the highest? We can see in that second year, the population builds and builds and builds until August, September. That's when we've got the most adults in the vineyard. That's when we're finding them in the fruit. That's when harvest occurs. So um, what I think is important is that we've got two periods of low density. Uh, usually during the winter time, uh, we, we have mostly adults. They haven't produced their egg sacs yet. Um, and this is probably a good time for control. We've got two periods of high density. Um, one big period of high density in two, two different years. Uh, this is near harvest time. That's the worst thing. The population is building. We're kind of forcing them up into the clusters by having almost nothing left in the understory. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And we've got uh, two periods of egg sex. Um, looking at all the data from about April until about October, they're producing egg sacs all the time. Again, one female can do up to six egg sacs, depending on how much she eats. But I would guess typically they're producing one or two egg sacs in the spring, and then probably one or two egg sacs again in the fall. So just kind of making it into a pictorial, uh, fall and winter, mostly what I find are adults overwintering, adult females. Probably they've been mated. They're just waiting for the spring to start moving out on that web. Um, in fact, some of the webs are not even kept up very well during the winter. Uh, in the spring, they typically are producing an egg sac, March and April. And then depending on food, you've got two or three generations, again, up to five, six egg sacs per female, but typically two or three generations from May to October go through. That allows the buildup. So what do we do to, to kill these things? What are the, the best insecticides? Well, in the very beginning, this work was done by Pedro. Um, I'll show you a video here. But we tested all kinds of products initially, Lanning, Gores, Panoplod, Omite, Apomectin, Provado, Danitol. We were looking for products the growers already use, that are already registered, and we're thinking that this could be a tank mix to go in with other treatments for leaf hoppers at the time, now with mealybugs. And we did this work with uh, field collected material that was then reared in the laboratory. We see a female inside there with the spiderlings. So we would put the female into vials, get egg sacs, get the spiderlings, rear them on different types of, of worms that we're rearing in the laboratory. Uh, get them to be different stages. And what we see on the right is a cage. And we'll see a video that shows the cage. This one's full of bark. 
If it was a residual study, we would spray the bark, then one, three, ten days later, add the spider. If it was a direct contact study, which you'll see in the video, we just put the spiders in there. So, let's see if I can get this to go. Uh, this is Glenn. This is uh, one, one trial. Each of these things is a replicate, and we would do about seven replicates. And you can just see the spiders moving around inside there. So, all the data you're going to see that I'll show you, this is uh, better coverage. We can all be happy. This is the nice video with Kathleen was showing the bad videos, spiders being killed, good videos. So, um, in our initial work, what we found was that many of the standard leaf hopper controls, the imidacloprids, the millibug controls, the moventos, obviously they don't do anything for black widow spiders. It has to be a contact material. So in the 2000 work, Danatol, Lennig, and Lorsband, with that type of contact spray, gave us 100% control of the spiderlings, the immatures, and the adults. So those were the materials we worked with for residual. Uh, Glenate surprisingly had no residual impact. It was Lorsman and Danatol that had some residual impact. But Lorsman was better than Danatol, and that makes sense. That was part of the reason why Lorsman was so good for volume millibug. It stuck around for a while, and that's part of the reason why it's, it's being targeted still um, by regulations, registration. We tried a number of other products uh, recently. Uh, we included seven because that also can be put on during the winter time, but seven was not nearly as good as Lorsman as a control. We tried a number of other pyrethroids, uh, baythroid, uh, Danatol is our check, leverage, leverage is basically baythroid and imidacloprid. Uh, Danatol still looks pretty good in all these. Baythroid looked well, um, looked good as well, and we did work with uh, Baythroid, I just highlighted in red, with the rate people are putting on. And we went down to 25%, 50%, 75% of label rate. And there was a similar reduction of, in effectiveness. And even at 25%, we're still getting about 50% kill. Um, so if people are putting that on at a reduced rate, you'd still get some material knocked down. Uh, Danatol was still probably the best all around material for an in-season spray. Um, one of the quirks we found with some of these materials is that uh, lower span, landing we probably should just ignore at this point in time. This was work from 2003. Um, spiderlings, everything killed spiderlings quite well. Probably how they metabolize. But the immature females, those ones with the colors on the back, even with Lorsban, we were getting less control of the immature females than we were with the mature females. I asked Beth Grafton Cardwell about this because she does a lot of work with resistance. And she said it could be a particular enzyme that they got during their development that might process the insecticide differently. It could also be that the female, because she's maturing with ovaries, is probably more susceptible, could be more susceptible, or maybe she's more active. So we didn't pursue this because we were just going for 100% kill. Uh, but just to note that these chemicals did not work the same against all stages, uh, which was interesting. So those were the products that we liked. What is reducing control? This is uh, Pedro. We're going to show you right now some data on black widow spider location on the vine. And during this time, I'm going to discuss why I think they're in the fruit clusters at harvest time. Um, so, they like in the vineyard what they like in your garage. They like hidden locations. They like to be low to the ground. They spread their nest away from their web, away from their nest. But the web is not their nest. Their nest is a little hidden location someplace by that web. So when you're in the vineyard during the daytime, you don't see the spider typically on the web. She is probably inside her nest, hidden away. Uh, they don't really go into exposed fruit or fruit clusters commonly, but what I think happens is that um, you've got this nice webbing down below early in the season during the winter. This is what we're finding, and we'll show some data on this. But now we've got these really dense overhead canopies. We're using, we don't have leaf hoppers anymore in the vineyard. 
Um, and so as we start to lose their, their food on the ground, they like pill bugs, they like little large beetles. You get one pill bug, you've had food for a month for this thing. Um, they start to move up on the vine, the web starts to expand going upwards, and they like these locations. This is a, a trellis system that the bark is grown, the vine is grown right up next to, creating a really good hidden location. Sometimes these sea, we call them sea clamps, were facing in towards the trunk. And as the bark grew against it, we had so many black widows inside that sea clamp because they could go out those holes that you see that are part of that clamp. There's no insecticide that's going to get to them inside there. A the very, very protected location. Um, overall, they like to be on the trunk. They like to be at the base. They're really rarely on the leaves. They're rarely on the head stake. And so what we think is happening, let's see if I've got this. What we think is happening, it's in a slide later, is that they tend to move up following the food source from that base, from that nest. And when the harvest crew is going through, they're getting a little bit spooked because we don't find many webs in the fruit cluster. We might find a, a single strand or a few strands going into that cluster, but they're, they're frightened, they're being chased, and they're moving into that fruit cluster at harvest time. And unfortunately, then they go deep inside the cluster, especially in the loose, looser clusters. You don't see it, it gets harvested, and they just hide out, they stay there. Um, so, what we're gonna see now is uh, what we really are excited about, why spiders don't work. Remember, they're nocturnal, so they come out at night. I'll show you data on that later. They're cryptic, so they go back to the protected nest, and they're fast, even during cooler weather periods during the winter. This is the sound of a tractor. You're going to see a little bit of a light off in the distance. That's the tractor's light coming towards us. Uh, we're filming with two different cameras. That volume is pretty high. inside the nest for the rest of the night. So that contact material has had time to dry. The spider then walks on the web with its legs, never contacting the insecticide. So that's why these good materials don't work. And we're going to come back to that later with another video. So with all this in mind, what do I think is still the best program? I still think that you get some impact by applying a delayed dormant application of lower span. I think then you've got to monitor to find out if you've got web, and we'll talk about monitoring later. And if you do have black widows in the vineyard, you've got to come in. Nanotol is still the best product, but most of the pyrethroids are working. We're still going to look for new materials. Something that might be is a tank mix. We'll try these new million bug materials as well. And of course, whenever you use anything, you've got to check MRL for where it's going because now you're spraying closer to harvest time. Um, what about spraying at night, like we were trying in that? Well, you get a little bit of a benefit. This is work from Pedro. We went out every single hour, um, and every two hours around the clock, we looked to see what was on the nest. And what you can see here, warm weather in September, uh, the higher it is on that chart, the more commonly we had a nest occupied, the lower it is on that chart, the nest that the web was empty, meaning the spider was inside its protected nest. So in September, they were out from about dusk to dawn. In January, they were out from about dusk to dawn. Not as frequently, 
about half as many, but at the same time. And so we tried spraying midday, dusk, and night. And we can see here that we got a little bit better control spraying at night than we did during the daytime because we caught more of them out. But again, from that video, you see it's not completely effective because most of them do retreat. So we're only getting about 30, 40% kill. And this is with Lohr's band, a material that had the residual activity. Uh, so with something like a pyrethroid with lower residual activity, we would have very poor control. Um, vine structure, we'll talk about cultural practices. This is why I think we're getting more of them in the vineyard right now. First, we've got a lot of overhead trellis systems. We've got a dark, darker canopy below. We're getting away from cover cropping. So there's less food at the end of the season down by the ground, by that nest. And so they're moving up further towards the fruit to feed. Our number one pest used to be leaf hoppers. Our number one natural enemy of leaf hoppers were other spiders. Other spiders kill the black widow. In the spider world, the larger spider wins. So the bigger spiders that were killing leaf hoppers would also kill the spiderlings, lowering black widow densities. We had an experimental vineyard at Kearney that we infested with black widows. Every single vine had three or four black widows on it when we started. And what we wanted to do was to find out what can the grower do when they're planting a vineyard to try to reduce black widow densities. And so those four pictures you see, and, and what uh, Dave is doing here is just loading up the vine with black widows. We did things from um, the cement pipes, we did different types of stakes, we put out milk cartons. I'm just gonna focus on, on a few things, the, the metal stakes versus the wooden stakes, and how far they were apart from the vine. So we've got metal stakes one inch from the vine, metal stakes four inches from the vine. And so you can see just from this graph, this is the uh, spiders per vine. We inoculated again with about three spiders on each vine. Uh, we're getting down to still 50% of the vines of the, of the cement valves still had a spider in it. It's a good location. They like cement valves, they like milk cartons, things like that. When the metal stake or the wooden stake was one inch away from the vine, we still were having about 25% survivorship. They still stayed there. When the metal stake was further away, removing some of that protection, we had a reduction in, in black widow spiders. So anything you can do to clean up that vineyard when you're planting, I know you're not gonna do it with an established vineyard, but in a new planting, moving that stake away, having a, a solid stake rather, rather than a sea stake might help reduce black widow densities. Sampling becomes key during the summer because they're cryptic, you don't know they're there. What we like to do is to look for hot spots like these metal stakes at the base of the trunk. We record about um, a thousand vines for webs. Uh, it's fairly fast to do this. And as we go through, we mark those vines and you can visit those vines at night. That'll tell you, especially if you put on a pesticide treatment, if that treatment was effective. What Glenn, Glenn is the uh, lab manager at Kearney, what he likes to do is just have a stick with him and he destroys the web after he sprays. Uh, we did some work this year. They'll rebuild that web later that night. So if you if you destroy a if you destroy a web, spray, then go back and check. Maybe you do this on 20, 30 webs, and 10 of the webs are rebuilt out of the 20. You only had a 50% reduction. And then also we um, so again looking at the base, uh, destroying the web, and working with the harvest crew. Um, I know growers pay them a, a bounty for black widows that they find, I don't think it's a bad idea um, to do that as well. So where are we gonna go with the future research? This is what we're very excited about, and uh, Andy actually put this to music. So first I'll show it, then I'll describe it. some kind of a cue to it. And if you've ever touched a spider web, 
if you stroke a spider web in a certain way, what happens is the spider will come out from its nest because it thinks there's prey in the web. So it's coming out to kill something. If you touch the spider web in a different way, it'll go back into a protected area because it thinks there's something dangerous out there that cues it to go back into its protected area. The vibration of the tractor just happens to be something that probably cues it to go and to hide. So what Glenn, we, had, we always have to collect black widows for these insecticide trials. We were doing it during the daytime, we're trying to dig these things out, and uh, Glenn's also a raisin farmer, and so what he did is he said, well, I'm just gonna go out at night with a flashlight, and he found that almost every third mine in his vineyard had a black widow on it, and they were very, very easy to approach with a flashlight. He could go up and just put them into the container. So we thought, well, walking up and the light doesn't really disturb them that much. It's, it's different types of movement. And we can go up and we can treat these with a handheld sprayer. So what we're going to do this next year is have a crew of about five people walk a vineyard at night. And we're going to compare that to an evening spray. Because if you don't have a lot, you can see these webs very easily at night. And we think it might be fairly cost effective. But that's not the ultimate goal. They've got all these smart sprayers that you see in the control weeds. And they're using laser-guided sprayers to put out a little dollop of spray on the weed. It recognizes the green. So maybe in the future, we can go down the row with a golf cart, something that doesn't have the vibration with a small smart sprayer on it, and have it recognize that black widow in that, that nest. And we, we're doing this now, basically, April, March, April is a good time. There's no foliage out there. They're very, very easy to see. And so we're going to test that as a possible control program. I won't show the video again, but I think it's a great video. So um, with that, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop and have time, hopefully, for some questions. I think I do have two minutes. Two minutes. And I want to thank the Collaborating Growers and Table Grade Commission for finding this work as well. Thank you.